that you'll need to, to successfully do these problems. Now, I don't. I only have the English. I mean, I have the international edition here, but the numbers I happen to do was from my book at home, which is the international or the English edition. So I might might screw up a problem or two. So keep an eye on it as we go through. So, uh, oh, most of these too, especially uh, as we talk about processes for the next couple weeks, all the way through the end of the chapter, we're going to be talking about processes. Uh, specifically, soon we'll be talking about enough processes put together that we'll come back to where we started and we'll have a cycle. And we'll need each of those processes well understood. That's four usually four different processes we have to put together to make this complete cycle. Uh, occasionally it's just three. Um, but still in all, uh, get in the habit for every problem of just sketching the process. Uh, some of them are very easy just from the wording, but do it anyway. Just a quick, quick little dash off, kind of like I do with the board on some of the problems, uh, so that these, these um, all these processes become just a, a part of the way we look at the problems because it's going to, it's going to, it's definitely going to help. All right, so the first couple problems, let's see if they were, in, well, did anybody have any problems in specific from chapter four that you want to talk about? Because uh, the, the first couple ones, pretty straightforward, piston cylinder device, usually that means a constant pressure process, but you'll notice on, on the first problem in chapter four, it's not a constant pressure process. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, the pressure changes a little bit in that process. So you just have to, uh, you have to take that into account. Uh, typically polytropic processes do have varying pressure, whether they're in a piston cylinder or not. Uh, so that problem five, uh, in the international edition is one that's in a piston cylinder device but is not a constant pressure process. Um, most of the processes in this section, certainly the early part of it, were polytropic processes. And that first problem is just one of those. Remember what that means? Polytropic process doesn't sound foreign, I hope. Just may not immediately come to mind what it is, which is which is why I I don't why all tests are open book open notes because most of you are uh, almost as far into Alzheimer's or something as I am, and that's why you can't remember any of these things. No, thermo comes with a lot of brand new stuff. Remember, a polytropic process is one where that combination, the product of the pressure times the volume raised to some power, is a constant. And we looked at a couple of those on PV diagrams. And if n equals 0, starting from some point maybe there uh, to some point there, that was, that was the n equals 0 line, and that was a constant pressure line. Uh, the first problem in the book is about a regular, straightforward, polytropic process. And so it goes down something like that. You're given the volume change, if I remember, and um, you're you're to determine the work for this one. Yeah, you're you're given now you're given the pressure and the temperature change, and you're to determine the work for this process. But most of the polytropic processes do something <coughs> like this. Um, uh, between zero and infinity, we can be in there anywhere, and then the n equals infinity 
was the uh, constant volume process. So we had all those possibilities in there. And so on that first problem, uh, basically all you had to do was, uh, was uh, figure it out for the, uh, the piston cylinder device as given. I think that's the right one. Problem four. Oh yeah, I was looking at the wrong one. Oh yeah, they give you, in, in problem four, they give you that it's a constant temperature process. Which is kind of in the middle here. What's N for a constant temperature process? Anybody remember, remember offhand? One. Because when we have N equal to one, that's a constant temperature process. That was volume, uh, pressure, that was volume. Uh, if N equals to one, PV equals a constant. Well, if you remember the other side of the ideal gas law, then you have uh, uh, a constant pressure process. If the right hand side is a constant, and those are both constants, then T must be a constant as well. So that's all we needed on that problem. Yeah, and the next problem was the one with, constant, with changing pressure and uh, temperature. And for both of these, uh, you had to find the boundary work. Remember how to do that? Remember how to find the boundary work. <coughs> this is when the boundary of the vessel, whatever is containing the, uh, the fluid, actually moves itself and does some work, and which is exactly what the, uh, the happens to the piston cylinders in your car as the piston moves. It's that gas expands in the piston because the explosion, the burning of the gasoline in the air, that pushes the piston out and that's doing boundary work right there. So it's just changing the volume. Sorry? Work has to be changing the volume. Uh, not quite. Well, there's one thing that works for all ends, no matter what. Um, but then once you know what N is, then the next step uh, determines what happens next. But remember what the boundary work was? Especially easy to see on a PV diagram. It's the integral of the PDB curve from point 0.1 to point 0.2. And so for any one of these, I'll just have to pick that one there, the any one, it's just simply the area under there, which for some of them is easier to do than others. Uh, but um, if you know what the relationship is between P and V, which is exactly what a polytropic process gives us, then you can do that integral. And some of them are worked out already in the, uh, in the book. For N equals 1, it's done. For ideal gases, a uh, couple examples are all in there. And it's given straight away for those. So that's what you're doing in problem uh, Problem 5 in the international edition, 7 in the English edition. You just need to uh, uh, use this and that to find the, uh, the work done. And this will already be integrated in the book, so you don't even have to have... You missed the joy of integration. <coughs> oh, no, no. Malcolm loves integrating. So that's basically all the first two are. Um, number 19 or 21 in the English edition. Again, just the, uh, oh, you're given a particular, uh, uh, it's actually a, a, an experimental curve fit for the, for the relationship between uh, 
the pressure and the volume. I think it's that. Yeah, then so you just need to integrate it um, just so you don't miss out on the joy of integration. Which is actually redundant if you think about it. Integrating is a joy, and so it's, uh, it's kind of redundant to think of it in any other way. Okay, 24. Wait, what we'll do is, is just kind of sketch these out, and then we can spend the, whatever leftover time actually working over any of them while I'm here to, to help you along. Um, 24 is one where you have a piston cylinder filled with a gas at, at some initial state but then there's a spring fit to the piston and I believe it's initially just barely touching I, it doesn't actually say whether it's it's just barely touching or not. In the English uh, version, this is number 26. But on, on this one, just to help you understand, uh, take it to be a linear state, <coughs> which means as the piston moves, the pressure will change in a linear way because of the increasing pressure from the um, the increasing force from the spring itself. So this one, you're given enough information to place the first state point, which is just under the dome somewhere. And you're told that uh, it's expanded to saturated liquid. Okay, by, by cooling the liquid, allowing it to cool that will cause it to contract. So it's, uh, sorry, I think I said expansion, it's contraction. But it'll do so in a linear way right to the dome. And again, you're supposed to find the work done as always on a PV diagram. That's the area under the curve. And that area is equal to the average pressure times the volume change. So if you find the two state points, you know the pressure of the two, you can average the pressure and uh, then find the place, find it that way. Um, if that's the easiest way to do it, that'll certainly work. Uh, work for me. But the hardest part with this spring is it seems like it adds some severe complication, but it doesn't. It just makes the pressure variation linear between the two uh, endpoints on the process. Watch your units on all of these, as usual, I hope. Especially in thermal, it's important. The pressure itself comes in about four different units that we use in this class. Okay. Questions so far? Are we doing all right? Is this helping or you want to... Yeah? Because you haven't started the homework yet, have you? spend your time working on chemistry. Doing your true love. All right. It's problem 426. Uh, 426 is one of those ones where you're given a table. Uh, 26 in the international edition, 28 in the English. Uh, you're given a table with a bunch of different quantities and you have to fill out the table based upon what's missing. And the table, I won't of course duplicate the whole table, but we'll talk about how to do these problems. The table looks something like that with 
some of the values filled in. We can do the first row. You're given 350, then a blank, then 1020, then 860, and then 3. And uh, units, kilojoules all the way across, except for kilograms. And kilojoules per kilogram. So you need to fill in the blank spots, and then there's six rows or something of this. So how do you do that? Anybody got an idea what to use? Use the first law. which in its most fundamental and basic form looks something like that. But uh, it's the first, the first two are, are, are you actually given anyway. Is that the way you wrote them? Q in and Q out, yeah. Or Q in and W out, so. So you just have to, to fill this out. For the first one, you've got essentially delta E given. So you can just start filling things in, watching the units as you get the pieces. Also, make sure you get the delta in the right direction. And when I was going through this problem, I kept messing that up. I kept subtracting these in that order, but it's got to be in the other order. And then you're given the pieces. You just pretty much have to make the numbers match. And so it's, uh, it's as straightforward as, uh, as that is. Okay. Watch your minus signs too. Don't force the <coughs> minus signs. And then for this last part here, you know that M times delta E equals delta E. So you can finish out the rest of the table. So it's just a matter of going through the table, being careful, watching the minus signs, getting things in the right places, uh, and just getting the order to work on those. Very straightforward problem. It's just easy to get a little tied up with uh, where some of the things go and, and uh, mix things up. But you, you, heck, you could even do this on ease, huh, Alan? Mm -hmm. yeah, he's already got it half mapped out in his head already. Because he's an ease meister. Okay? Anybody do that problem yet? Nope, too many boxing lessons. What? I wasn't even involved in that initially. Why did you just randomly bring me into these stories and make them ridiculous? <laughs> I don't think, I think your presence makes them ridiculous is what's happening. Can I quit? So, okay. really? Is that a promise or a threat? <laughs> Could be either. Okay, well we'll take it as a promise then. <laughs> uh, all right, problem 29. By the way, any questions on these, bring them up as we're there. If you want, otherwise we'll, uh, we'll move through them a little bit. And then uh, you can spend the rest of time working on them. Problem 29, um, 32 in the American edition, uh, is a well-insulated, rigid tank. Remember what the rigid business tells you right away? Uh, well, this, this whole chapter is a cl of closed systems anyway, so that's, that's always true of any of these. And yeah, that uh, rigid tank, 
unless it says otherwise, we could have a rigid tank with a valve on it. Um, uh, Trevor, I think you said it? Yeah, that's uh, obviously a, a constant volume problem. But then it says it's a, a well-insulated rigid tank. What's the well-insulated business mean? Um, we use Pink Panther brand insulation from Earl down at Ace Hardware. There it is. Don't put that stuff in unless you're wearing long sleeves, huh? That sucks. Yeah, that sucks. The rest of your day is miserable. But you do that and then tell your wife, huh, now I'm miserable, huh? Now all I can do is sit on the couch. <coughs> she drinks me iced tea. What's that mean? The well insulated. Because Again, this is information for every one of these problems, almost all, especially those kind of words, rigid tank, well insulated, give you part of the solution. Does not mean constant temperature. Doesn't mean no heat changes because that doesn't even, that, that's, that's an improper use of the word heat. Heat is transferred from one place to another in this class, but heat doesn't change. If the energy contained in heat can change to another form of energy, but heat doesn't change from one thing to a, from one kind of heat to another kind of heat. No heat comes from outside of the system. Sorta. Of? Well, that's pretty much what he said. You just said it in a uh, highfalutin form. <laughs> no heat transfer is what it means. Q is zero, either way. So Q net, not only is Q net zero, but individually Q in and Q out are zero. Q in, Q out, Q net, equals zero. That's that simple simple set of words that well insulated means precisely that. So you're given a liquid vapor mixture so you know it's under the dome, you know it's constant volume process and you just have to put the other pieces together. Initially three quarters of the mass is the liquid phase. So we're under the dome, you know that from the words uh, liquid vapor mixture, three quarters of the mass is the liquid phase. Uh, put us kind of over near the right side there. And then, uh, and then what? It says, an electric resistor placed in the tank is connected to a 110 volt source. So we have a liquid vapor phase with a, an electrical resistor in the, uh, in the uh, tank. That's turned on uh, 110 volt source, 8 amps. You decide if this stuff's important. is turned on until, oh, find out how long to, it'll take to vaporize all the liquid in the tank. So what's the process look like? I'll just move this down a little bit, give us a little room. Does what? Constant volume process. Straight up to the dome. I knew you could get it, come out with it all. So just until all of the liquid is vaporized. Alright, so you need the first law from this. Uh, one way you can tell that is because it's that section of the book. They tell you what section you're in with each problem, so that can help you a little bit.
told that the heat transfer is zero. You're supposed to find how long it takes for this process to occur. How long must this heater be on for all of this liquid to boil into vapor? We can do that with a little bit of a change. If we have the rate at which work is being done, or any of the, uh, any of the energy transfer mechanisms, if we have the rate, multiply it by the time, then we get the amount of work that's done. So the, if you can come up with the rate, then this is, this is how you can introduce your, your time factor. And then the, uh, the same kind of thing over here, only you don't really need that because that is just delta E, and delta E is the change in the internal energy of the system. Well, you can figure out the mass of the system. You can figure out the two state points. So the right-hand side is fairly straightforward to come up with. That's the kind of thing we've been doing for for about two weeks now, just finding the state points, coming up with the values we need from those state points. Once you establish the state point, you know all of the properties that you need, and more. How do we do that side? Because there's the delta T we need to solve for. So how do we come up with this? The volt stamps, the go on. The rate, let's put, we can put a little E on here because the only formal work we're doing is the electrical work. Remember, we consider this work done on the system, not heat being added to the system because heat does not cross the boundary. Electrons do. Once <coughs> inside the resistor, they turn into heat, the, their energy turns into heat, but it's electrons crossing the boundary, not heat. How do we find the power, the electrical power supplied? Yeah. Who's taking circuits? Anybody? No, you haven't. You did? How'd you do? It's 880 watts. A B? Okay, so the electrical power. Who else took it? Everybody. Two? So you know the answer. You're just, you're, la you're waiting to see if she does. <laughs> what do you think she'd say if I gave her the chance? Three times up. <coughs> Three times up. And you're given both of those, so it's a pretty straightforward problem. You got a little bit to work through with the units. There is some work still to do. Uh, you do need to establish this state point. You're given enough information that from that you can find the... Uh, quality of that state point, you'll need that to establish all the other, uh, other, uh, all the other uh, points that you need. Yeah, that's, you're going you're gonna to need that. So you're, you're given the quality in the letter, in the wording, and from that you'll need to find U1. You'll also need to find V1 because that is what you need to get to the second state point. You know that you're in a, uh, that same specific volume and you're on the dome and that's enough to fix the state point. When we say uh, for the state postulate we need two intensive independent properties, quality is one of those. And saying that we're on the dome is the same thing as saying the quality is one. So those words give you the second state point you need for that problem. So the bulk of the effort is just actually establishing those two points so you can come up with the, uh, the uh, 
internal energy you need. Uh, bulk the effort, except for Alan, because he does all the problems on ease anyway. So it's easy. 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 You betcha. Hey, I don't think it's I don't think it's any accident. That's what they named it. All right, questions so far? You're starting to wonder, what am I going to do tomorrow? Everything's done. All the hard stuff's done. I don't have anything to do now. So, problem, let's see, problem 36 international, 39 English. Uh, so it's the same kind of problem we just had. It's a, one of those spring-loaded... Um, One of the spring-loaded piston cylinder devices. This one is just a slightly different process. Again, the deal is with this on the PV diagram. <coughs> the pressure varies linearly since it's a linear spring. If it wasn't a linear spring, then the pressure wouldn't vary linearly, but it would still vary as the uh, force on the spring varies. Since the force varies linearly, then so does the pressure. You're told... Now, oh, this is an ease one. There you go, Alan. Got to do this one on ease. But I'll set it up for you. Uh, yeah, you're given the initial state point. Initially contains steam. <coughs> that tells you you're outside of the dome somewhere. That's the steam region and the superheat region. The temperature is greater than the saturation temperature for the same pressure. Heat is slowly transferred to the steam, causing the pressure and the volume to rise to given values. Since you're outside of the dome and you remain outside of the dome, if we have steam and we add uh, more heat generally, you're going to stay in the steam region. You're given the temperature and the pressure of the second point, and that's enough to fix it. Because outside of the outside of the dome, temperature and pressure are independent. Under the dome, they are not. But outside of the dome, they are independent. So having those two values will be enough. And then I believe what you're looking for in this problem is the work again. Show the process up. Oh, we just did uh, find the final temperature, the work done, the total heat treat, heat transferred. So again, you can use the first law to find any of the pieces that you don't have directly. What is really this? Like is to find the work and stuff like is it? No, it, it's not built so in. No. So we have to do the integral yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah, but the integral is easy since it's linear. Again, it's it's just like the other one was, where you can use the average pressure between these two to get this to get the same area. Well, in, um, internal energy is a function in these. Yeah. Oh. The value, the, the properties, yeah, are, are um, all resident in ease. But calculating the work um, from a, some given process is not available in ease. It can do it once you set it up right, but it's not available there directly. Let's see. Can ease do, like, integrals? Yeah, it can. If you give it a functional form, it can do the integral. You just the, but you still have to type it all out. It's harder to come up with the equation in this line to let E do the integral than it is just to find the two pressures and average them. So uh, don't uh, don't make things more complicated because you think just because it's named E, it will be easy. All right. I 
think those are all the first law problems uh, in that chapter. So questions on those? Because then the next ones stepped into what we talked about the last class, which was specific heat, uh, change in enthalpy, change in internal energy, those type of things. Remember the definition for enthalpy? Check your tattoo. See, that's one that would just fit right here too. So you could act like you're wiping your nose in the test, but you're really, really just smearing it. And we said, boy, I wish I got a permanent tattoo instead of just writing that in ink, because now it's all over my nose. And we don't want that. That's as bad as walking around with chalk smudges all over your pants. Who would do that? Definition definition of enthalpy. With the pink shirt, you can't see the pink chalk. It's not pink. This is man pink. You can't see the man pink chalk on it. Blends right in. This is man pink. It's striped. It may look like pink back there to those guys, but you can tell this is man pink. Plus, I got the sleeves rolled up. I got one button down a little bit. Plus that right there. That is a, that is White Earp's Tombstone Sheriff's badge right there. That's the actual one. That's it right there. So this is is not a pink shirt. Thank you very much. I just don't understand the distinction between pink and man pink. Like they this, both have pink in them. This is man pink, isn't it? You okay. see it. <laughs> of course you wouldn't wear it. You were a Marine. But <laughs> if you were man enough that you could wear some form of pink, this is what you'd choose, isn't it? <laughs> what what did the Marines wear for uh, breast cancer awareness month? Didn't they have pink uniforms? Pink, pink camouflage. <laughs> no. The National Football League didn't mind, but oh no, not the Marines. We're not allowed to do that. <laughs> well, gosh darn it, your skin's nice pink. <laughs> so, definition of enthalpy. Anybody. U plus PV. Merely a definition of convenience. Just, just a way. Uh, if this is physics, we would have named it after a dead white male German physicist. Uh, just a matter of convenience, so we don't have to keep writing those letters over and over and over. Um, but then we, the, the two are linked, if you remember, by the. Specific heat calculated along a plane of constant pressure or along a plane of constant volume. Remember the definitions for these? I bet you do. This one's the partial of the change of enthalpy with respect to temperature along a plane of constant pressure and this is the same kind of thing only with internal energy along the plane of constant volume. Remember that's not the process description it's just this description of the calculation itself and each of these are essentially functions of temperature, which means for ordinary materials, they're calculated and tabulated and available in some form. And so the uh, several of the next couple problems have to do with uh, either looking those particular values up, boxing, looking those values up 
uh, at the, in, in the different ways because we have them as constants at room temperature, which is an okay uh, approximation for fairly low temperatures. We also have them for common, uh, some common gases as functions of temperature tabulated right there. And you'll see they don't change an awful lot, but they do change a bit with temperature. And then we also have this one as a, uh, a polynomial function with the coefficients given in the table for the different gases. Remember the relationship between the two. is the ratio of C sub P over C sub B. What's K called? It's called the ratio of specific heats. I didn't know that. It's right there. And you're just thinking, oh, it's got to have some fancy name. No, ratio of specific heats. Um, for incompressible substances, remember what the deal is with the specific heats? Like uh, liquid water, we consider uh, an incompressible substance. In fact, most uh, liquids are. This is not funny. This is from an You're talking about how Josh's muscles are incompressible, like we talked about last time. He's across the, in the lab, though, so you can tell him that yourself. Too. His muscles are incompressible? <laughs> I'm sure certain people in class have given him a little squeeze to see. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't want to box somebody with really big biceps, do you? Why? <laughs> Phil, would you? Yeah, why? Why would you box somebody with really big... <laughs> Phil, would you? <coughs> no way. No way. And some people, didn't, aren't you, aren't your hands registered as lethal weapons? <laughs> yeah, as long as it's not seven rounds. See, you could, wear pants. <laughs> <laughs> you could wear pants and throw everybody off. They'd say, oh, what a sweet guy. They wouldn't notice, oops, that's why their tombstone and chair is bad. What is it? Thanks for getting off topic, everybody. <laughs> Paul wants to learn. Let's do that. Uh, remember what this deal is with specific heats and incompressible substances. C sub P equals C sub B. C sub P equals C sub B. A uh, lot of times, then, they just drop the subscript since it's meaningless at that point. If they don't, it's fairly typical that the P is left on there. So don't get don't get uh, don't get swayed by that. Don't get confused by that. Well you can if you want, I don't care. Uh, so most of the other problem most of the problems through the rest of the rest of the chapter are involved with either finding these or finding the change in enthalpy or the change in internal energy once you've found the specific heats. And that's a matter of just integrating these equations. And so delta H is C sub P. Well, uh, specifically, it's C sub P D T from T1 to T2. But if C sub P can be taken as a constant, which it can if T1 and T2 are pretty close together, or it can if all you've got is a constant for that. And several of these problems are a matter of working those out, deciding, uh, actually working through the same calculation in a couple different ways and determining how much error there is. And again, if the delta T's are big, you're going to have some rather substantial area errors um, if the delta T's aren't big then uh, 
it's not much problem. But it could be too, you just don't have enough information to do anything else but to uh, treat this as constant. And then the integral is easy. So you got a couple problems to go through uh, doing exactly that. <coughs> And then there's a few problems to sort of bring all of that together. Um, U.S. edition 69, international edition 64. Then ask you to, to, to bring some of these things together. Um, 69 is, is kind of similar to that one with the electric heater in that you're given a, a student dormitory room which uh, most of you didn't even know what those were but now we have them on campus so that's that's pretty cool and now you know what we're talking about when we say dorm rooms uh, was a dorm room with a fan in it that was left running by a student, hoping to cool off the room so that when she got home it would be nice and cool. We wanted to see you talk this up. Dorm room with the fan running in it. Ah, uh, it'll be nice and cool when I get back. But of course, that'll move the air around, but all of the electricity that comes in and it will turn into uh, heat just as if the electric resistor was in the room so you're asked to find estimate the uh, estimate the change in temperature if left for I think it was 10 hours again this is uh, 64 in the international edition 69 in the uh, local. So this one's very similar to the other one, uh, assuming that the room is a closed system, which isn't necessarily true. Rooms and uh, houses are pretty, pretty leaky. Uh, Assume it's well insulated. And then it was a matter of taking the power generated by the, the uh, fan. And in circuits or physics three, you may have called that ohmic heating. The heating through a resistor. That's uh, just what's going on here. Um, told to do it for a couple hours and then you know the size of the room which means you can figure out the mass of the air in there and then you can figure out the change in temperature <coughs> and it's it's she's going to be really sorry she's going to come back to her room and it's going to be uh, 15 degrees warmer than when she left so that was dumb. She 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 should have just uh, just had boxing practice in there for all the heat she generated. So how do fans work? How, why do they cool people off then if they generate this much heat? It's, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's the wind speed effect when air hits your skin. How yeah, it's, it's wind chill. Wind if, if this air's not hitting you. Uh, then it's not going to be cooling you off much. It can stir things up if there's a central place for the heat that's collecting. It can uh, circulate that and reduce the local average where the heat generation is. But uh, do you, what do you? Yeah, you part, part bear. Need to get that scholarship. Gee, I don't think you're going to get any scholarship now. Or bear? Bears are a minority rate right? in college. Uh, yes, they are. Except at the University of California, the, the, they they are the bears. The California.
in his fares or something. <laughs> hey, Malcolm wants to learn now, even though Paul has given up. <laughs> Slightly off topic, but no. Um, <laughs> you. <laughs> why is it that wires that are supposedly have you know almost no resistance, you know, real world wires when you work with them? Why is it that they still uh, throw off a lot of heat? Even though they have almost no resistance, because that's not that that's because almost no is not no, and <laughs> <laughs> Phil, Phil, help him. There's there is resistance, even though it's almost no. Plus, the actual resistor wires have greater resistance. Plus, they're just really long. That's why a lot of times the resistors are just coils. It's just mm. that much distance is, is enough for the heat to increase. All right, then the last problem. Oh, no. There's two more. Oh, yeah, there it is. Uh, second, the penultimate problem. Penultimate I means second to last. Okay. Uh, International Edition 75, American Edition 80, gives you a two-process process to put together. So, um, air is contained in a piston cylinder device fitted with a uh, with a set of stops. So what this means is that uh, the, the, the gas is heated, the piston can rise, but it only rises up to a certain place where it's blocked and stopped at that point, yet the heating continues. So on a PV diagram, and this is this is a uh, gas. <coughs> yeah, it's just air. This turns into a two-process process. What do they look like? Start at, start at some, some given point, and then heat is added to the system, and the process would look like, yeah, constant pressure process, because the piston is allowed to float to some point where then the piston hits the stops. Yet heat has continued to be added, and so what happens then? That's why. Then uh, the pressure now rises because of the added heat, but the volume can't change, so you're given that pro the, this, this two-step process there. And you're supposed to find the work done, determine the work done and the amount of heat transfer for the process. So you can do that in two steps between points one and two, and then again from two to three. And you have to establish the state points from what's given. Any of those parts zero, what I just wrote up? Work two or three. This? Why is that zero? There's no area under the PV diagram, so that one's zero. And you can figure out the other parts as given. Oh, they, they do help you a little bit in that the uh,
they tell you that the fresh the, the volume doubles so you go from v1 to 2v1 and then in the other process the pressure doubles so that helps you with with uh, all those business all those pieces And so given those parts, the uh, work from one to two, you can figure out from the area. You can find out U2 and U1 from the state points, or from C sub P. Sorry, C sub B. And then you can figure out the other the other pieces from that. <coughs> and then the very last problem, you're asked to find the temperature change. No, the amount of heat added to an egg with the egg. Um, estimated or, or, or approximated as a sphere. So you're given the density, the sot and the radius. From that you can get the mass, and then from that you can find the uh, the the change in uh, how much heat is added. Yeah, you're given a, a specific heat for it. And you're given a delta t, so that that one's pretty pretty straightforward. The hardest part is remembering what's the volume of the sphere. Yeah, check your tattoo. It's on your other finger. No, oh see, I thought you were holding up your other finger, Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, on this graph right here, do you have specific volume and regular volume? Uh, this is supposed to be. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's just a matter of multiplying by the mass. Oh. Okay. The process processes still look the same. Okay. That wouldn't change. The only way that would change, that they wouldn't be the the same, is if uh, the mass changed. That's it. That's all the homework all done for you. Take you what uh, uh, two cups of coffee to finish it. Three three half calf and five uh, decaf. It so you easily cut it from like eight hours to six. <laughs> that's that's a two hour boxing practice right in there. Or it two is. hours looking for a back scratcher. <laughs> <laughs> or just two hours of scratching your back. <laughs> See Wobble. <laughs> yeah. Box with one arm and scratch with the other. Okay. So if you want to spend the rest of the time working on some of those, work on the harder ones, especially while I'm here to help through the details. You've already done them all? Have you done any of them? Yeah. yeah. But pretty much now. What are you mumbling? <coughs> You're mumbling chemistry? Thank you.